Okay, good morning. I'd like you to turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 21. We're going to begin reading in verse 10, and we'll read to the end of the chapter, and we're going to be looking at the home of the bride, uh, what it looks like, what it's what, what our future home is like. So beginning in verse 10, it says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof, and the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth, and he measured the city with the reed, twelve thousand furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof an hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a, a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth uh, chrysoprasus, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw not, no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. So as we look at this city, our eternal dwelling place, the, uh, the place where the bride, the Lamb's wife, will spend eternity. We notice, first of all, about the light of the city. And it says in verse 11 that this city is lit by the glory of God, having the glory of God, what we often call the Shekinah glory, although that term is not found in Scripture. But uh, certainly uh, we see the Shekinah glory is something very bright, something very brilliant. Uh, we, we know, for instance, that um, the Shekinah glory uh, filled the temple, uh, in Second Chronicles 5.14, it filled the tabernacle in Exodus 40, verse 34, and it certainly will give a light and a radiance that will transmit through the, the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, such will be the light of this glory. And, and just to give an example, uh, when the Apostle Paul was on the road to Damascus, and he saw the glory of the Lord Jesus. In fact, it blinded him. He wasn't uh, able to uh, cope with the brilliance of it all. He said it was brighter than the midday sun 
in the Middle East. So that gives us a real sense of the brilliance of the glory. And so for all eternity, the glory of God will be seen in this holy city. It's the only light the city will need. Uh, the God, later on, it's going to say it's the glory of God and of the Lamb. So that's going to be the light. And of course, uh, it's so interesting because that's a description of his character, isn't it? I just was studying First John last evening, and we were looking at verse 5, and it says this, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So it's a very reflection of his, his character. So the light of the city is a physical manifestation of the nature and character of God. The city itself has no intrinsic glory of its own. It is the glory of God that gives it splendor and radiant glory. And so it says, uh, having the glory of God, her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now, I want you to notice that he uses um, the phrase, uh, it was like, and he's going to use it quite a bit in this section. He's trying to describe something uh, in human terms that we'll be able to grasp. And he's using things that we can kind of at least get some idea, some conception of uh, suitable language to describe the radiance. And so he says it's like, the, in a sense, the scintillating sparkle of a diamond or the clear quartz crystal that sparkles and shimmers in the light. It's interesting that cities on Earth often have dark places that are to be avoided. There are dark alleys. There are places where you, you just wouldn't want to be there in the dark. But this city, well, it's full of radiant light. Now, again, I was just thinking about this this morning because some of us um, find light very difficult. For instance, some of us find driving at night, especially with a halogen headlights, <laughs> and uh, it can be very, very blinding. But we got to remember that in this new city, we will be there in new bodies that are entirely suited to our new environment. So we can't think in terms of, oh, wow, I don't know whether I would like that because I, I find too bright light really bothers my eyes. Don't worry about it. Uh, your eyes will be adjusted perfectly so that you will be able to enjoy the brilliance of this heavenly city. And again, that's part of the reason why we have to have this new body to get us ready for our new environment. And so again, no dark places in the heavenly city. It's going to be lit by the glory of God. And then we also notice in verse 12, it says, and it had a, a wall great and high, and then 12 gates. Now, again, if we look ahead, we get a sense of the size of the wall. Um, in verse 16, it says, the city lieth four square and the length as, as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. So when we uh, work out uh, what this size actually is, it, it comes out at 1,500 miles high. That's quite a, because the city is going to be four square, 1,500 by 1,500 by 1,500 miles or for our dear Canadian friends, 2,414 kilometers. Now, we're talking about a huge city. Uh, and then the walls are uh, their measurement in terms of the thickness of them. Verse 17, he measured the wall there of 144 cubits. And again, that, um, that would be 216 feet thick or 66 meters thick. So I want you just to imagine this 66 meters thick thick wall or 216 feet going up uh, for 1500 miles now it from an engineering standpoint it almost seems that the walls are too thin but don't forget god is the perfect builder you remember he's the builder and maker is god and even if in our engineering terms it might be seem almost too high to be that thin although 216 feet is pretty big but don't forget, God is the builder, and it's going to work absolutely perfectly. He has the perfect architect, the perfect builder. 
And so it gives us uh, a sense of the wall around the city. So why is there a, a wall around the city? Uh, it, it's not because the city needs protecting, because there are no external enemies to bother the city. Usually in the Old Testament, you know, a walled city was built primarily for defense to keep enemies out. But the residents are eternally secure. All enemies at this point have been confined to the lake of fire. There is nobody there to attack. So why the need? Well, it's more to give the city definition or boundary. It's to give us an idea of of the extent of the city in other words it's not some cosmic nirvana you know this idea of nirvana is that there's just kind of nothingness no th there's definite boundary here there's definite shape there's definite space and so uh, it certainly is giving us a clear understanding of the dimensions of the city and of course, uh, what a city it will be. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try and put it in terms we can grasp how big the city is in a short while. But I just want you to get the idea that, first of all, in terms of the glory of God lights the city, the walls of the city uh, give the get kind of a sense of dimensions to the city. There's, a, there's a, an extent to it. And then out of the city, there's gates, and then we go into the new earth. Remember, the new heavens, new earth. And so the new earth is outside of the city. And so this, this city will be on the new earth. Also, notice the gates. And it says um, in verse 12, it says, It had a great wall and high and had 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Now, so there's 12 gates. There's actually three on each side. We get that from the following verses, verse 13, on the east, three gates, on the north, three gates, on the south, three gates, on the west, three gates. So cube-shaped, three gates on each of the four sides of it, all directing to the four points of the compass, as we would understand it, and 12 in total. Now, we're going to see one of the things in this chapter that's repeated over and over again is the number 12. 12 gates, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 pearls, 12 apostles. Uh, just over and over again, 12 is going to be used. And interesting, in biblical numerology, 12 is usually the number connected with government or administration. And so the idea is being conveyed to us is that this city is going to be the administrative capital of the new heavens and the new earth. The fact that the there are angels, 12 angels, um, each posted at a gate is, again, of great uh, curiosity to us. Well, what's the purpose of the angels? Well, maybe the idea, remember, they're messengers. Maybe... Uh, the new earth, which will be populated by nations, and we're going to talk about what that means and who they are in a moment. But the idea of maybe the angels are there waiting to be dispatched on some errand uh, to, to the various nations. They certainly are not there to guard the doors, because again, there's no enemy to threaten, uh, but they're there. And uh, certainly, uh, we're told in 1 Corinthians 6 that we're going to judge angels. I, and that's kind of an interesting dimension to even think of, um, maybe in terms of uh, administrative judgment, to giving them responsibility, giving them uh, things that they have to do for us in, in order to administer this new heaven and the new earth. But then he talks about the fact of these gates, and we said there are three on each side. And again, do, do we not get a picture here? Do you remember in the Old Testament, in the book of Numbers, when the nation of Israel were to encamp in the wilderness, and you had the, the tabernacle in the center, and then the tribes were all on different sides, three three on the north, three on the south, three on the east, three on the west. And so we, we, we have kind of an echo of Numbers chapter 2 here. And, and again, just a, a thought that, that would be that in the city, it's where the bride is. And it also, we said, it's the, the place where 
the spirits of just men made perfect are there. So we'd say Old Testament saints are there. But remember that when the Lord comes back to the earth at the second advent, all Israel will be saved. Remember Zechariah 12, they look on him whom they pierce, they'll mourn for him. And then Israel that are alive at that time will go into the millennial kingdom and they'll serve for that thousand years. At the end of that thousand years, everybody that goes into the new heaven and the new earth is going to have to have new bodies in order to be able to cope with the glory of God. And so they, at the end of the, that period, will be resurrected. And they these, these 12 tribes, I believe, are going to be stationed outside the gates overseeing the nations in the heavens and the earth. Now, they'll have access because the gates are always open. They can come in and, and others will be able to come in. The gates are always open, but they're going to be stationed at these gates. And so he talks about the fact that uh, this uh, the, the, the gates, there's 12 angels, and then there are also the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel on the gates. And so one for each of the tribes. So again, that's the picture that is being conveyed to us. It says in verse 14, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And of course, we recognize, don't we, that uh, how foundational the apostles were. Remember, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Ephesians 2.20. And so uh, the these apostles are, well, remember Abraham, he looked for a city which had foundations <laughs> and this city has foundations, but it talks about the foundations being uh, the 12 apostles. Now we'll think about that in a moment, but I want to just think about the idea of foundations for a moment. Foundations speak of permanence. Many of the people that are going to be in this city are people that spent their lives living as strangers and pilgrims. Here, they had no continuing city. They look for one which is to come. Now, here's a city that has foundations, no longer tent pegs that are easily removed. It has foundations. And so the idea is that pilgrimage, uh, being a stranger, has finally come to an end, and we will finally be home in that place, that city that God has prepared for us. So the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, these men were very unique. They were a, a unique link between the earthly Israel and the church. They were a remnant of a nation that believed that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God, and they were also the foundation of the church. And so the nucleus of the church. And so they're given this place of prominence, uh, their names written on the foundation, the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And so again, we, we see this language of Hebrews 12, 22 through 24, uh, that the, the the city's population includes not only the church of the firstborn, but the spirits of just men made perfect. That is the eternal home. Now, we see in verse 16, we've already mentioned the measurement of the city here, uh, but he, 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 and he's told in verse 15 to measure it. It is interesting, verse 15, he that taught with me had a golden reed, to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And it's, it's kind of an interesting thing, isn't it? John, uh, in Revelation 11, had been told to measure uh, the tribulation temple. If we look back there, you'll see Revelation 11 and verse 1, he gets to measure the tribulation temple. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Of course, this clearly is the tribulation temple that's being measured. If we look back at, ex, uh, at Ezekiel, sorry, Ezekiel chapter 40, we, we see the millennial temple, again, is to be measured. Uh, Ezekiel 40, verse 3, he brought me hither, 
and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass with a, with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed. And he stood in the gate. And then we get this description of the millennial temple. Again, it has to be measured. And so now, once again, we're now looking at the, as it were, the, the eternal dwelling place of God and his people. And once more, there's a, a measuring uh, rod uh, to do it, a golden reed to measure the city. And we said it lies four square. It's a, it's a cube uh, in uh, just, just like uh, the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies in the temple. It's a cube shape. And again, we already gave the dimensions 1,500 miles or 2,414 kilometers. So let me just kind of put it in terms of the sheer cubic size of it. It would be three and a half thousand billion cubic miles. Plenty of room. You get the idea? Now, let me put that into kilometers. Five and a half thousand billion cubic kilometers. And <laughs> so it's pretty big. In fact, just to, to put it, can it help us put it in perspective? Um, if it was placed on the current North American continent. The first marker would go on the Pacific coast in Vancouver. And then you'd come across from Vancouver, continuing east through British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, into Ontario, as far as Thunder Bay. Okay. And then you'd head southward from Thunder Bay down through the northern states, down through the Mississippi Valley until you reach the Gulf of Mexico. And from the Gulf of Mexico, then you'd go west back to the Pacific coast and then back up to Vancouver. That's the dimensions. And But then, of course, it goes up the same direction. <laughs> so what we're talking about a, the hugest city you could ever imagine. A city of this size is too large for the imagination to take in. John is certainly conveying the idea of both splendor. There's no city that we've ever seen that will be compared to this city. And also, more importantly, that of room for all. Great space in this city. Henry Morris, the man who was instrumental in the creation movement, he he said that if there has been 100 billion people in the human race throughout history, just speculating here, and that just assuming 20% of them will be saved, he calculated that each person would have a block with about 75 acres on each side <laughs> to call their own. In other words, it's not going to be overpopulated. <laughs> There's going to be lots of room and uh, a very spacious place indeed. Now, again, it's very high, highly speculative, but what we can say is that there's lots of room. And of course, everything that the Lord said would give us that impression. Remember when he talked about this, this, this banquet that he wanted people to be invited to, and he kept saying, but yet there is room, yet there is room. And then we, we think of the Lord Jesus, and he says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. <laughs> in other words, there's lots of room in this heavenly city. So we also saw verse 17, the measurement of the wall. He measured the wall thereof, 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of an angel, 66 meters. And so again, just a it would actually be 7.9 million feet high. <laughs> That's some wall, isn't it? Incredible. And again, we just we, we see the, the staggering extent of the city. Now, the gates, not only are written on them the name of the 12 tribes upon them, but we also get a little bit of a description of the gates. Um, let's um, notice, for instance, in um, verse uh, verse 21, it says the 12 gates were 12 pearls. 
Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was of pure gold, and it was transparent glass. So I want you just to think of this. Obviously, these gates, it's they're massive. They have to be massive so that the nations that are on the earth can come in and out through these gates. And, and so it's the largest pearl you could ever imagine. And so what is the point of it? Why do you have to have gates of pearl like that? What, what, what is God trying to convey? Well, we, we do know this about a pearl, that a pearl is the product of a wounded side. It's born in suffering, right? It's some, some irritation that's put into the side of the clam, the oyster, and, and it, it secretes something to cover it up. And, and so the idea is this, that everybody who goes in and out of that city will be forever reminded that it's only because of Calvary. Our entrance is because of the one who's had a wounded side for us. And so 12 pearls. And uh, again, what, what a wonderful thing that we'll never, ever be able to forget Calvary. Uh, just even the very entrance in and out of those gates, there's a reminder eternally of the one whose side was wounded for us. We talked about the fact that the 12 apostles are on the foundations and, of course, also the 12 tribes of Israel. And isn't it interesting that we're not only we're going to be reminded of the wounded side of the Lord Jesus, but we're always going to be reminded of biblical history in both covenants. We're going to always remember the history of Israel because the 12 tribes of Israel are going to be written on the gates. And also the 12 apostles of the Lamb are going to be remembering the New Testament era as well. And so we'll never forget biblical history. It's always going to be there as a reminder. The work of Calvary, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And what's so, so fascinating to me is this, that in our cities today, oftentimes some famous person has a building named after them. You go to New York and there's the Rockefeller Center, you know. And so all of these elites of the world, they want some legacy left behind, some something, you know, named after them. You go to university campuses and all the buildings are named after some rich benefactor. But here we're going to see in God's city, the elites and the movers and shakers of this world will be long forgotten. But those that will be remembered are those that have walked with God. Those in who the writer to the Hebrews says, whom the world was not worthy. <laughs> These are the ones that will be ever brought to our remembrance. We'll remember the 12 tribes of Israel and the heroes from the various tribes. We'll remember the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So now we think of the material of the city. And verse 18 he says, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. I want you to notice down in verse 21 as well, and he says, the street of the city, towards the end of verse 21, the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. So, so both this jasper uh, that we see described of the city was pure gold. It was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. And then the streets of the city... Uh, pure gold is transparent glass. So I, I want you to just notice the emphasis on transparency. And again, I want to suggest to you, the point is this, that the glory of God that's in the city, the, the, the city itself is going to be so transparent that that glory will be able to, as it were, shine from the city over the whole earth. And there'll be nothing that will prevent the transmission of the light of his glory throughout the whole earth. We also notice in verse 19, the foundation of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. Uh, the first foundation, Jasper, and he goes on and describes all these various jewels. And one person, I like what they've said. They said, uh, it's, it's almost like the foundations. Now, often the foundations, we don't usually beautify the foundations of a house because they're usually not the focus of the house, right? The, the, it's it's the, the, the upper echelon of the house that gets noticed. 
But if the foundations of this city are pebble dashed with precious stones, <laughs> and I don't know if you get the idea of pebble dashed. They used to do that a lot in Ireland. They have a concrete wall and then they would kind of spray pebbles on it and it would be called pebble dashed. And so I want you just to get this picture there, that the very foundation of the city is pebble dashed with jewelry. And so what do we what picture do we get? 12 different varieties of jewels. What we're seeing is this. Our God is a God of beauty. And he will lavish his beauty on the city he is preparing for his people. Now, it's very hard to precisely identify the gemstones that are mentioned here in modern terms. But... All we need to do is we don't need necessarily a description of all of them. We need to get the big picture. The big picture is this staggering beauty. Everything about this city is going to be beautiful. And it's not so much even given the impression of wealth and luxury, but it's really all pointing to the glory and holiness of God. That's the picture. Uh, the, maybe the closest thing we have to these gemstones is the high priest's garments uh, and his breastplate in Exodus 28, where we have 12 different types of gemstone that are mentioned. But I just want us to see that God is, what he's going to do is going to be beautiful. Uh, there is, uh, we said, this transparency dimension as well connected with the city. And so again, the, the idea is the city is designed to transmit the glory of God in the form of a light without hindrance. And so everything about it, staggeringly amazing and beautiful. But there are some things that are missing in the city. Yes, it's incredibly large, larger than anything we could conceive. Yes, it's amazingly beautiful. Yes, it's got a remembrance of Israel and of the 12 apostles, but there are some things that are not there in the city. Verse 22, and I saw no temple therein, for the Lord all, God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Again, this is different. In the ancient world, it was unthinkable to have a great city without many temples. That's what made a city great, because it had all these temples. It's like saying today, I saw a great city, but it didn't have a bank <laughs> or a great city. And there was no shopping mall in it. And there's something distinctly missing here. No, this is a great city. And he says, there's no temple in it. Why is that? Well, because temples are generally associated with sin and sacrifice. And in this city, the inhabitants need no place of worship or sacrifice because the object of all worship is present and the great sacrifice himself is also there, the lamb and God. They're there right in the city. So there's no temple since the entire city will be indwelt by God's presence. Indeed, the, I, the terms that we often use today, sacred and secular, will be indistinguishable in this city. It's all the sacred precincts of God and his people. And, and so uh, the idea of somebody who's a profane person is that there's profanum, there's, there's, no, there's no temple there, there's no sanctuary. That's the, the meaning of a profane person, no sanctuary. Well, in, in this city, it's completely a sanctuary. It's where God dwells in perfect communion with his people through the work of the Lamb. And so, no temple therein. The Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, verse 23, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Remember the Lord Jesus said, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with thee before the world was. So here's the Father and the Son, in their transcendent glory, and that's enough. There's no need for any artificial light or even created light because the glory of God and the Lamb is sufficient. 
also, uh, we'll just look ahead, but 22 verse 5 says, There shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And so, again, no night. We'll comment more on that when we get there in verse chapter 22, verse 5. But again, we'll be constantly basking in the light of the glory of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb. So what about the multitudes in the city? Well, look at verse 24. It says, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. So, again, what we're saying is that the distinctions in 1 Corinthians 10.32, Jew, Gentile, Church of God, are universal forever distinctions. So even in eternity, there will be a recognition of the 12 tribes of Israel. The Jew will still be there. There'll be the spirits of just men made perfect in the city. There'll be the 12 tribes that came through the millennium and didn't rebel. They will be surrounding the city. And then there will be the nations that didn't rebel with the enemy they will also populate the earth in the new heavens and the new earth. And so it's encouraging to note that not all were destroyed when the nations did battle against Jerusalem. Remember in Revelation 20 when Satan's loosed and, and there's like the sand of the sea, but, but it's not everybody. And there'll be kings of the earth who will be part of the eternal state. And so they will they will be on the earth and they will have access to the city. The gates are always open. They'll come there, as it were. They'll, they'll bring their glory to it. Now, of course, um, in the eternal state, we believe there'll only be glorified beings. So these nations are not certainly going to be a threat to it. Nothing will ever threaten the peace of the city because everybody on the new heaven and new earth will be glorified beings. But the ancient practice of kings and nations bringing their wealth and glory to the city of the greatest king will continue, not just in the millennium, but in the eternal state. And so let's just look at verses that speak about this in terms of the millennial kingdom and see, and it's important to see that the millennium is almost like a, um, a, a, a kind of a, a foreshadowing of the eternal state. There, there are things about it that kind of reflect the conditions in the eternal state. So Psalm 68, I'm going to look at a few references uh, to this idea of the kings bringing their glory to the Lord. So 68.10, because of, the of thy temple at Jerusalem shall kings bring presents unto thee. Uh, he says, uh, chapter 72 of Psalms, or Psalm 72, verse 10 and 11, the kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Here all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Uh, Isaiah chapter 60. So these, these are millennial scenes, but we're going to say that in the eternal state, those nations on the earth are going to do the same thing. Isaiah 60, verse 1 through 3, Arise, shine, for thy light is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Verse 6, the multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, and they from Sheba shall come, and they shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. Now that's millennial, but now we're seeing the very same thing will continue in the new heavens and the new earth. Those nations that will be there, and the kings of those nations they will come and they will bring their glory to the city, perhaps as an act of continual worship uh, to the Lord and to, uh, to God and to the Lamb. Notice as well, verse 25, And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. 
no fear of thefts, you know, today in our cities, to be out in certain districts in the city at nighttime is a very risky thing. There's no night there. There's no fear of theft. They don't, uh, the reason we have doors and we have locks and all the rest of it is partly because we don't want to be burgled. We don't want to be attacked. And so the, the, the gates are open. There's nothing to fear anymore. And there's no night where people will do their things. And again, it says, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations unto it. Building on verse 24, uh, it's um, the worship of, in the worship of Israel, was interesting that a Gentile couldn't come past the court of the Gentiles into the temple in the old uh, in the in the Old Testament. In fact, if you remember, when Paul was arrested, part of the reason that he was arrested was they inferred that he had brought a Gentile into the temple. And for that reason, they wanted to stone him. But what we find now is that's not going to be a restriction. Remember, it's a redeemed world. Everybody will be redeemed. And so they'll all have access. They'll be able to come through the gates. They'll be able to bring their glory. There'll be no barriers found in the new Jerusalem, such as were found in the old economy. And then verse 27, there shall no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of light, of life. So no defilement there, no deception there, no, no lie there, because the deceiver is in the lake of fire. No debauchery there, nothing abominable. Never again can the devil, the one behind every abomination and every lie, remember he's the father of lies, never again will he emerge to instigate sin. You know, some people worry that, well, you know, paradise was once you know, kind of ruined, right, uh, uh, in, in Eden. Is it going to happen again? Are we going to find ourselves, do we have to go through all this again? And and the assurance here is this, there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defiles, neither whatsoever works abomination or makes a lie. And And so again, it's like God is assuring us, this eternal state will never be disturbed. It'll never, ever find ourselves in a predicament where sin enters in so it's not inferring that the nations that he's just been talking about are going to be a threat it's just the exaltation perhaps is twofold one assuring us that when we get there it'll be undisturbed glory joy and peace but secondly perhaps the other side of it is that it's also a, a kind of a, a an exaltation to people. If you want to be in this city, <laughs> you've got to get your name in that Lamb's Book of Life. You know, again, he's writing, and there's a present application. Nothing will ever enter in there and, unless their names are written in that Lamb's Book of Life. And so it now is the time, if you want to participate in this future city, to turn your loyalty, loyalty to the Lamb right now. Now, we want to just look a little bit from verse chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, and we're going to have a, a little glimpse inside the city now. And so the city internally. And again, we've got reminders from the book of Genesis here. It says, he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manna of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So it's kind of like, pictures of Edenic conditions, not only fulfilled, but expanded. And so we move into this city, 
and many of us, maybe our conception of the city, especially for country boys, is, you know, grime and pollution and all. But I want you to get this picture of a, a magnificently beautiful city, but inside of the city, there's river, there's a garden, uh, it, it, there's absolute staggering beauty in the city as well. And so he talks about this, uh, this pure river of water of life. Throughout the Old Testament, Prophets often use the picture of a river as a powerful expression of richness, provision, and peace. And so I just want to look at some of the, the verses that talk about this, this lovely picture of a river and, and what it conveys to us. So we're going to begin in Isaiah's prophecy. Isaiah chapter 48 and verse 18 Oh, that thou had hearkened to my commandments, then had thy peace been like, been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. Peace like a river, uh, because um, that's a that's a familiar picture to us. In the book of Zechariah, chapter fourteen, verse eight, we see again a millennial foreshadowing of this great river. Zechariah fourteen. And verse 8, it says, And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and winter it shall be. So again, it's the idea of, of abundance, of provision. Um, perhaps one of the greatest expressions uh, that we could think of is in Psalm 46. Let me just read Psalm 46 in verses 4 and 5 where we read this it says there is a river the streams whereof shall make glad the city of god the holy place of the tabernacle tabernacles of the most high god is in the midst of her she shall not be moved god shall help her and that right early interesting that uh, this song of korah from the sons of korah uh, it's um, it talks about this river in the city of God, but the interesting thing about Jerusalem is it's never had a river, and it won't have a river until the millennial kingdom, and then the new Jerusalem will have a river, and it's an unusual thing. Most capital cities are built on rivers. London is on the Thames, you know, just that's the way it is. A capital city is usually connected, but this one doesn't. One of the gladdest things on earth is water. There's nothing in all the world so precious to the eye and the imagination of the inhabitants of the dry, burning, thirsty East as a plentiful supply of bright, pure, living water. What a glorious picture it is. One person puts it this way to let us, God is describing this to let us know that in heaven, there shall be no want of anything that can make the saints happy. And again, it's clear as crystal. God's provision in the New Jerusalem is described with pure, absolutely unpolluted waters. Waters that are literal waters of a nature and quality answering to that of the golden city to which they belong. Man on earth never knew such waters as men on earth never knew such a city. But the city is a sublime reality. And of course, this river is a direct provision from God. It comes right from God's throne. And so he tells us it proceeds out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And so what a glorious river it will be. And then, of course, uh, there's the tree of life. The very thing that was denied to Adam and Eve after the fall, they were banished Genesis 3.24, cherubim set at the east of Eden to prevent them from having access to the tree of life. And now we find that all citizens of the city are welcome to help themselves to the tree of life. It says the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits, yielded a fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And so a fresh crop of different fruit available each month. And again, there's 
got he's using the term month even though we get our months based on the sun and the moon and the the whole kind of cycle of those things but he's just helping us to understand that that again using familiar terminology the variety and plentifulness of the fruit that will be available for us and so this access to the tree of life now available to the redeemed humanity and for the health of the nations now what does that mean that we're going to get sick <laughs> and we need you know kind of to take the medicine from the tree of life that's not the idea at all the leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations is is a figurative way of saying that they will enjoy perpetual health the word healing is the word therapia from which we get our english word therapy the primary meaning is care or attention lavished upon others so the leaves of the tree promote the enjoyment of life in new jerusalem and not for correcting ills which do not exist the river and the tree symbolize the abundant life that will be enjoyed in that glorious city and of course verse 3 says and there shall be no more curse but the throne of god and of the lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him that which was brought in in genesis is forever gone during the millennium much of the effects of the curse are suspended but there was still sin there remember we saw that in isaiah 65 that the sinner will die a hundred years old 65 verse 20 now it's banished forever no curse, no sin, no, the only evidence that there was ever a curse <laughs> is the fact that the lamb will be there. <laughs> the sacrifice will be there. The one who came to redeem humanity. But the last glimpse of the lamb we get here is seated on the throne. It's interesting as we've gone through the book of Revelation, we've noticed that there are three particular movements in the book of Revelation. The first movement climaxes the church age in Revelation 4 and 5 when Christ is enthroned in heaven. When he comes up to the one seated on the throne, when he takes the, the, the scroll out of his hand where he is given that place. And then in the second section, ends in revelation 20 where christ is enthroned on the earth reigning on the earth for a thousand years and now finally we see christ enthroned in the new heavens and the new earth in the holy city the new jerusalem and again in each i mean there's no book in the bible that so exalts the person of christ it puts him always on the throne whether it's in heaven as it is now, whether it is on the millennial earth or whether it is in the future, new heavens and the new earth, and his servants shall serve him. That's the word that is usually means priestly service or worship. And so it has the idea that his servants will continue to serve him. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve will be universally true. And again, what a wonderful thing. You know, right now, our service for the Lord is often handicapped by sin and weakness. But in the eternal state, we'll serve him without any weakness, without any sin, and we'll be perfect service in a perfect environment. Well, our time is gone. We better stop there. We'll pick up verses four and five and the rest of the chapter next time. But I hope that you've got some kind of a, an, an appreciation of the piece of real estate that I've just described, which one day will be your new heavenly home. Amen.